started. So welcome uh, uh, and a good afternoon to all of you. It's, it's great to see so many of you. Uh, and, and I'm amazed that we have some standing people. So I'm, I'm, I hope that we can find chairs and seats for those of you who are standing. Um, but this is, this is great to, to be here uh, and welcome you to one of the Knowledge Cafe series that the World Bank uh, has been doing since our last annual meetings in Marrakesh. It's a, it's a new uh, effort for, on, on our behalf and it's a really an effort to get a lot of our work that we do uh, out there, uh, share with you, but also learn from the discussions we'll have uh, this afternoon with many of you, including uh, colleagues here sitting with me. So um, with that, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Ifat Sharif. I'm the Global Director for the Social Protection and Jobs Global Practice at the World Bank. Um, and I want to first start by actually asking a question to all of you. How many of you in the room uh, know what Partnership for Economic Inclusion, otherwise known as PEI, is? I just want to see a round of hands. How many of you actually Okay, so not very many. So this is great because then you're here and you learn something new. I'm so I'm delighted that we'll be able to, to offer some, some information to you. So, you know, the Partnership for Economic Inclusion is, is actually a unique um, partnership between the World Bank and many other uh, institutions ranging from uh, community-based organizations to non-profits to philanthropies to foundations to research organizations to UN agencies it's really a multi uh, uh, stakeholder initiative to help governments scale up what we call national programs on economic inclusion and this is a really an effort to help the poor the extreme poor and vulnerable uh, uh, stand on their feet and really help them move along the income distribution so it's really something that is at the core of the bank's uh, of mission and vision as you know you know we, we we are really doubling down our efforts to to end poverty on a livable planet and the work that the partnership for economic inclusion with colleagues here we do are very much at the heart of, of that effort um, so, you know, and, and, and to talk to us about, uh, about the, this partnership and the work, we all have our colleagues who are um, partners on, in the partnership uh, of economic inclusion, so that's known as PEI. Um, and so before I, um, uh, you know, I, I start with a framing uh, uh, presentation, I want to introduce uh, first um, Diane uh, Calvi, who's the president and CEO of uh, Village Enterprise. Um, and so Diane is an advocate uh, for the most vulnerable and, 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 her, and her, under her leadership uh, since 2010, uh, Village pa uh, Partnerships has really managed to innovate and scale up uh, their activities. And when I look at the numbers, Diane, I'm super impressed. Uh, you know, I see that you've been able to train thousands of hundreds of individuals um, that helped to start over 80,000 plus micro enterprises uh, businesses and lifted over 1.6 million people out of extreme poverty. So hats off to you. That's an amazing effort, and I'm delighted that we are here. You're here with us. Um, uh, joining Diane, I have here Gregory Chen, uh, who's the managing director of the Ultra Poor Graduation Initiative at BRAC International. Um, and Greg here comes with 25 years of experience um, uh, on poverty reduction and financial inclusion. Uh, and his experience spans across South Asia, including uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, so we share a, a, a passion there, I suppose, um, uh, Greg. Um, but prior to joining the, the BRAC International, Greg was a colleague here at the World Bank uh, at, the, at, the, at the consultative group to assist the port, as we call a C-GAP. And so um, delighted to have you, uh, uh, Greg. And you know, BRAC International is one of our partners uh, as well. So I'm glad that you're representing uh, 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 BRAC International with us today. Um, so maybe um, uh, we can get started with a very brief sort of a few slides that I wanted to share with you but, and all of you um, to get us started in the discussion. Um, uh, and, and these slides are really to kind of give you a little bit of a preview of what's coming in PEI. We have a um, uh, uh, we, uh, in a PEI um, we, we have a new um, uh, 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 volume of a report that is going to sort of collect the evidence that we have the work that the partnership has been doing over the last three years 
uh, that will be launched in a few months. So today we want to give you a few uh, 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 preview of some of the work that will be in that as a way to set the stage for this conversation. So can we start with the PowerPoint? So, so in a way, uh, the, what we want to sort of start with is to tell you, you know, what is the challenge here? Like what, what motivated us uh, BRAC International Village Enterprise to join forces uh, behind this partnership. Really, the challenge here, as you see, is that you know economic growth is not always inclusive. Um, uh, many of the poor uh, find it very challenging to to um, uh, to withstand the, the 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 situation, the poverty traps that they find themselves. And if I just give you one statistic here that you may have heard, that in the next 10 years, we are facing. Uh, we're facing uh, a, a tremendous challenge. Uh, if you look at the mega trends uh, on, on demographic transition, you have a, a billion young people who will be coming into the workforce, yet you will have only 300 or so million jobs. And so this effort that PEI uh, is putting behind on, on finding uh, how poorest and the extreme poor and vulnerable can actually have a job opportunities could be very, it would be a hugely important initiative going, going forward. Um, and we know that, you know, uh, given the statistic and given the challenges uh, we have, that many of the, the, the youth or, or the people who will be in the labor force will be finding themselves in informal, low productivity, low paying, insecure jobs. And, and this gives us um, the, the, the encourage, you know, so this really makes the solution that we have, that we want to share with you, tremendously important. And this is where the, the work of, of this group on economic inclusion programs becomes quite um, pivotal. Uh, and, and really, what the solution really is, 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 is trying to offer a multi-dimensional set of uh, interventions to help think about the multiple constraints the extreme poor face to help them move along uh, the income distribution. So here it's a really a package of services that, that brings together a combination of assets, a bring together a combination of uh, uh, business capital, uh, cash transfers to cover basic uh, needs, uh, 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 business skills training, um, some coaching assistance to really help uh, these uh, micro entrepreneurs start businesses and actually bring their products and services to the market. Um, and so that's really in a nutshell this very simple solution, but yet of course it is not easily done and as you'll see in the next slide, uh, you know, um, it, the reason why this, this how, how it works is that it really helps uh, move people along four dimensions of transition. In many ways what we see this, this economic inclusion programs help achieve is, is a shift for households, uh, extreme poor households, from doing basic subsistence farming to more non-farm-based um, non enterprises. There's a transition along sectoral uh, channels. A, a second channel that you see transition along is on spatial. So in many cases, a lot of these interventions are happening in very remote locations. Uh, with small scale interventions, and that's kind of really bringing structural change and changes in the structure of the local economy. So you're having some spatial transition, and, and, and many of your work, Diane and Greg, you can speak to that from, from your own first hand experience. A third you know, transition that you see is an occupational one, which is you start to see how skills uh, start to, you know, the, 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 the beneficiaries who start using the services are able to build their skills along having you know, almost zero to no skill, I mean, and no skills to low skills to having a bit more sort of uh, training in, in terms of their capacity to have business skills, uh, coaching to think about um, uh, other ways of, of accessing markets. So you see a transition uh, in their skills level. And a fourth dimension where you see a transition in these programs is what we call organizational, meaning you start to have you know, household-based enterprises slowly move along the value chain and you start adding more workers and, and, and capital and, and you really see a shift in this kind of uh, production processes. So, so really this is kind of the channels we, through which we see these, these interventions work and, and it's a nice way to then think about how, why, they actually then have an impact the way we uh, that way we, we see that, and that's you'll see in the next slide that actually the evidence suggests you know a tremendous um, uh, impact that these pro programs are having on multiple outcomes and not just on income. As here you'll see that we see significant change in, in income levels. You see significant improvement in consumption levels. Um, 
and, and really it's, uh, you know, I, in a way I must kind of focus on my, my notes because this is really important, right? Because not only do you see this increase in incomes and consumption, what we see is that, you know, these kind of increases can happen between a really short period of time, you know, between 12 to 18 months. And that, for any of you who are involved in implementing programs, that is a fantastically short period of time before you see impact, right? And this is not just one study, but it's evidence after evidence. And when you look at the countries, you know, whether it's Niger, Senegal, Zambia, Nigeria, Afghanistan, these are not easy contexts. You see these kind of impacts. So I think this this gives us, you know, a huge encouragement about these uh, about these, uh, these these programs. Um, uh, but then again, as I said, you know, the other outcomes that we see is in food security, asset holdings. Um, I mean, it's almost too good to be true, mm -hmm. right? If you look at some of this impact. Uh, but I think the question that many of you may be asking, and I've also asked myself, is the one in the next slide, is that. As I said, it's too good to be true, but does it work? Meaning, how cost effective are these programs? Because clearly, the kind of effort that you put in is, is tremendous. And here, I, I, and this is my favorite slide, actually, because if you look at the cost effective and the return, what you see is, is, is and, and, and here it's, it's, um, it's coming from uh, an example in Niger, you see a benefit to cost ratio of 127%. Uh, and so that really, what this really means is that for every dollar you are putting into these programs, not only are you getting one dollar back, but you're getting additional 27 cents. Now, if you multiply that by millions of beneficiaries, you can really get a sense the scale of the impact these programs can have. So I think, to me, this is as a, you know, this is just incredibly effective tool um, that that you know takes me to my, my last slide to sort of say, you know, where to next then? Given that we have the evidence, given that we have evidence not just from one, but multiple countries, given that we have this evidence from very hard uh, conditions and context, you know, wh what does this mean? And this is really where we would like to have this conversation with all of you and get your thoughts and ideas and help us along with our colleagues to see about how do we then get to scale? Because one of the fundamental efforts of the Partnership for Economic Inclusion is that we want countries to take these programs to scale, to be nationally owned and really get, take these efforts and interventions to, to not just millions but billions of people across the world. And I think this is where we need to think about not just uh, multilaterals, but every single partner on the ground, whether it's a small NGO to large uh, uh, philanthropies, to foundations, to research organizations, that we can come together and create an ecosystem, if you will, to help us take this to scale um, and, 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 and think of really the biggest, you know, the elephant in the room is financing, obviously, right? And, and how do we sort of think together uh, uh, ways in which we can have sustainable financing to get to get these programs to scale um, and, and governments to adopt them because some of the evidence that we've seen many of them come from NGO work but uh, many of them also are coming from large government uh, scale uh, government uh, programs so so with that you know I would really um, you know want to come come to you maybe first Diane um, to to kind of tell us given your own long history of working to empower the, the extreme poor and, and vulnerable, uh, including women, refugees, um, youth uh, in rural Africa, you know what? What are what are the three key lessons um, that you know our audience here can take away in terms of making these kind of programs successful in addressing the kind of really structural constraints that many extreme poor face? So maybe you know if you can sort of give your thoughts and reflections from your own work maybe five minutes and then I'll come to, to Greg. So yeah. why don't we start with you and then um, over to you, Greg. Yeah, thank you, Beth, and thank you for your insightful remarks and the importance of building this ecosystem and collaboration um, with the World mm -hmm. Bank, nonprofits, the private sector, yeah. foundations, and how important that's going to be as we work to scale this work with governments okay. and as governments adopt this programming uh, to serve the world's most vulnerable people. Um, Village Enterprise is a nonprofit uh, working in rural Africa. We equip people living uh, in extreme poverty with the resources and skills 
uh, to become successful entrepreneurs for the first time. And as Efath mentioned, we, we work in rural communities where there are very few formal jobs. And um, in, these, in these communities, people face multiple poverty traps that prevent them from lifting themselves out of poverty. And we believe that working together with the World Bank, with BRAC, other NGOs, the private sector, that we can change that. And Village Enterprise Economic Inclusion Program graduates people out of poverty. And we do that by providing people with intensive business and financial literacy training by a local business mentor. Um, after they receive their training, the participants receive a cash transfer to start their business, um, as well as they receive ongoing mentoring and digital tools that help them run their business. The participants are also organized into savings groups and get access to value chains and formal financial services for the first time. And this is what's exciting. At the end of just one year, 95% of our participants are running successful businesses. EFAF mentioned the success after just one year, 95%. Um, and they're not only running successful businesses, they're generating income and savings for the very first time. And that, those income and savings is quite significant. Over the years, we've continued to innovate and adopt our model to different contexts and specific populations, women, youth, refugees. And our approach is a community-based approach, which means that we work with the local communities as active participants in designing and implementing the program. And to evaluate our impact, we've worked closely with research partners over the years to develop the evidence that EFAF mentioned uh, for this model. And we've learned many lessons, but I'll try to stick to just three, three lessons for sake of time. Um, the first is that most people living in extreme poverty need more than just cash assistance to start a business and lift themselves out of poverty. And that's really important. They need more than just money. Two, that innovation can drive increased cost effectiveness and scalability. So these models can become even more cost effective. And three, that co-creation with government is critical in scaling these programs. So to build the evidence for our entrepreneurship-focused poverty graduation model, Village Enterprises conducted two randomized control trials in Kenya and Uganda. And our first RCT with Innovations for Poverty Action benchmarked our program against not just a control group, but a group receiving cash only. And we learned that people living in extreme poverty need more than money to build a sustainable business and income. We also learned that our poverty graduation program generated more income and savings than just cash alone. Families eat more nutritional meals, and they feel better about themselves and have greater agency. The evidence from both RCTs also showed that our program was extremely cost effective. In our second RCT, for every dollar that was invested in the program, $5.40 of long-time income was generated by the new businesses um, in just a few years. Village Enterprises seen that innovation can drive greater cost effectiveness for economic inclusion programming. And some of the innovations that drive that cost effectiveness are our group-based model. We start businesses in groups of three, and we train in groups. Both the training and mentoring takes place in groups. We also have enhanced our program with digital innovations. Um, we provide mobile cash transfer, digital training videos, digital bookkeeping, and linkages to financial services and markets. And all of these innovations drive greater cost effectiveness and impact. But to scale our economic inclusion program, we know we need to partner with governments. And that's why Village Enterprise is committing to working with governments in all of the countries of operation we work in. Um, we work at both the state and the uh, excuse me, at the local and the national level, and we co-create every step of the way. We know that context matters and that each government is unique, so co-creation is critical. 
Um, in Kenya, we've been working in partnership with the Kenya National Go Government on the World Bank funded uh, CASA project um, for over three years. And together with our partners, we've worked closely with the national government uh, to roll out poverty graduation in five counties. But because we want to scale across the entire country, we believe that county engagement is also critical. Mm -hmm. um, and we've received funding from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to support the development of county government policies and help them develop the information systems they need to implement this kind of programming. So our goal is to engage both the national and the county government in Kenya. We're also working in close collaboration with the Ministry of Local Government in Rwanda to roll out uh, poverty graduation programming. And in this case, it's with a grant from USA Development Innovation Ventures. And this milestone-based grant is uniquely structured to drive results, drive positive results. Um, and to scale up the program, we've, ple we've pledged to secure an additional $28 million. Ifath, you mentioned the need for additional funding. So we are co-fundraising together with the Rwandan government. Um, and we've already secured $1.5 million from the French Development Agency. The overall goal of this project is to lift 1 million Rwandans out of extreme poverty with the ultimate shared goal of eradicating poverty in Rwanda by 2030. So in closing, Village Enterprise believes that entrepreneurship, innovation, and collective action with governments are the key to eradicating extreme poverty. Thank you, thank you, uh, Diana. This is, uh, I think, you know, the one of the words that keeps coming to my mind as I listen to you is co-creation, right? This is really about co-creation. So I want to come to you, Greg, because obviously uh, um, BRAC pioneered this, this graduation approach back in 2002. Um, and, and, and in having worked with BRAC in Bangladesh, I'm reminded of something that the founder of BRAC, uh, you know, Sir Abed used to say, you know, small is beautiful, but big is necessary, right? Yep. And I think this is really the, what we're trying to sort of say, like, we really need to have this big push, uh, because I know you mentioned a million Rwandas out of poverty, but the world right now has an extreme poverty level of 700 million individuals. So we really need to have a big push to get 700 million people out of extreme poverty. So Greg, you know, this means huge capacity needs at the government level, um, all the way from national to regional to local government. You know, your, your thoughts, um, you know, what are some of the opportunities and perhaps challenges um, that governments may encounter when they are trying to reach this kind of scale? From, from the work that you've been doing in RAC International. Yeah, so thanks, Ifat. Uh, great to be here. Um, just to say, I mean, BRAC has been around for 52 years, but uh, this is in some ways the flagship program for us because it's, it's been the one that we believe has the biggest global evidence base behind. And I would go back on the ROI and I would say in some of the evidence we're seeing in West Bengal, and in Bangladesh, seven, ten years on, is that the ROI is getting up past 400%. And so the point there is, and, and let, let me go back. I took on, I left the World Bank two years ago to take on the challenge of this job, which is the question around how do we get to scale with something we believe has a strong evidence base. And I, there, were, there were three things that I heard in our space that were holding us back. And I'll call them the three C's. One was complexity, uh, the second was contextualization, and the third was cost. So let me pause there and say I've, been, I've taken that as sort of the conventional wisdom so far, but I've gone around and I've spoken primarily with governments for the last two years. And this is not their main concern, in fact. Their main concern is that I'm spending huge amounts on trying to solve the poverty problem, and frankly, it's slowing down. And it has been slowing down long before COVID. There was this hardcore group of, let's call it 100 million households, it may be plus or minus, but it's somewhere in that range, or close to half a billion or slightly more than half a billion people. And what we were doing before was not working to solve 
the fundamental problems at this base of the pyramid. Now go back to 2002 for BRAC. We started this program after being in Bangladesh for 30 years. We started it because there was a recognition that a lot of poverty had actually reduced in Bangladesh. But by 2002 or late 90s, we were showing that there was a subset of households who were not able to benefit from, from Bangladesh's broader growth. What could we do for that subset of households? So that is in essence, um, and you know, Village Enterprise is one of the great practitioners of it, and Diane will share with me that there is a science to it. And it sounds, we can talk, we can go into some more about it, there is actually a science to it. But let me come back to the three myths. So I think the first one on complexity, I think to some extent BRAC, and I'll blame us a little bit for this, we made it feel a little bit more complicated than it actually is. Um, and maybe because we wanted to give advice and show you how to do it and do a lot of those things. Frankly, governments do much more complex things. They run health systems, um, they, they deliver HIV and AIDS sort of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, programs. Those are much more complex than what we're talking about. So first of all, the complexity is not actually a major challenge. The second is really around cost. This is something I hear a lot. And frankly, and if I'm sitting in BRAC, cost is an issue because I need to raise money to run the very large program we run in Bangladesh. But I go to India. I was in India last week. They spend $100 billion a year on social assistance programming. And their big question isn't how to raise more money to do it is how do I take that hundred billion dollars and spend it better? Now I can go down the list, not everybody has got the resources that India has. You can go down, we work in Indonesia, closer to 75 billion dollars in social assistance every year. Go to South Africa where we work, closer to 70 billion dollars in social assistance every year. Now you get to some other countries, it starts to become one billion, nine billion, but these of course are going into sort of lower income countries. The issue though, how much does this program cost? If we were to cost it out, $1,000 a household to end extreme poverty, that's $100 billion. India's one-year budget solves this. This is not fundamentally a cost question. So I just want to step back, and I don't think the governments view it that way. I think they're worried they're spending a lot and not getting the results. That's been my conversation. And so the reason we're able to have conversations with governments is that they want to take their existing programs and make them much better serve the remaining households and communities that live in extreme poverty. Um, so I think the challenge, if I was to come back to that, is, is sort of working through the change management process with government counterparts to get them through some of these processes. And let me, let me show a few glimmers of hope on this. We work a lot in India where this idea has been around for almost a decade. And um, we have actually partnership now in six states. But one of those states is Bihar, which has been running a program there with some help of some private players. With The World Bank has played a huge role in, in, in Bihar in helping set up the rural infrastructure. There they run a program for 13 million women. But uh, within that, they have a program, a special window um, called SJY, Sat Tat uh, Jivako Parjana, Yojana, uh, SJY, which is actually just now getting to 200,000 households. We talk about cost, the government originally allocated about $1,000 per household. It's election season, I know we've got to take it with a grain of salt, but the chief minister late last year upped the amount to $2,000 a household. Now this is out of their state budget. So I'm just going back, they've figured out the complexity, they've figured out the cost, and, and they've figured out how to contextualize it and make it work in that context. And so I just come back and say our, our, our job is really a change management uh, role um, and, and helping governments build some of, the, some of the, the, the changing some of the systems to be able to give special focus to these regions and these households. I don't think, I think it's also just, um, sometimes it's a, it's a failure to want to take on some of that change that we're confronted with rather than real barriers that, that exist. I, we just haven't seen those barriers be real in the places that we're talking about. Well, thanks, thanks, Greg. So it seems like this session is all about words that are starting with the letter C, <laughs> right? Because I, I hear co-create complexity, but demystifying that. It's conceptualizing the cost issue 
And I think I would add my, my fourth uh, C, which is commitment. Is I think it's what you're saying is really about commitment uh, on, on, on governments, on all of our part to really do this and do this right because, you know, the kind of the, the, the ROI that you're telling me is, is mind-boggling. Uh, but maybe it's time to come to the audience and I want to sort of see if there are any skeptics in the room <laughs> left after all that you've heard. But let's, that's, you know, the whole purpose of these uh, knowledge cafe sessions is to really have an informal interaction with with all of you to kind of hear your thoughts but, uh, and, and reflections, but also ask any questions that you may have to our panel uh, panelists here, but, but really any, any questions on, on what you heard. Um, and, and maybe we open up for um, another 10 minutes or so. Um, anyone from the floor want to come in? I see a hand here and a third and one in the back. Do you want to start the gentleman in the back? You had your hands up, and then we'll come to you. And please introduce yourself so we can also know who you are. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting and very commendable. My name is Pablo Auxili. I work for Pearson, an education company. Sure. One of the largest challenges we find whenever we venture into the fields that you're constantly living in is regulation and infrastructure. When we assist, we collaborate with our entities. Sometimes the country's regulation plays against us. The case of electronic cash management transfers is one. And the other one is infrastructure. People with very small production volumes getting transportation logistics for their products is a big, big challenge. Can you speak to how you work with governments or with communities to that effect? Thank you. Uh, let's take two more and then I'll come back to you. The gentleman sitting in the second row. Hi, my name is Paul Divakar. I'm from uh, Andhra Pradesh in uh, South India, but I'm working with uh, intergenerationally excluded communities mm -hmm. of hierarchies, social hierarchies, like caste, uh, and it's just not in South Asia, but we also work in Africa where pre-colonial forms of slavery, uh, not the white and the, and the typical polemic, but the existing hierarchies and also with the Kilambola communities in Brazil and of course the Roma, Sinti, Gypsy in uh, Europe. We have a global forum. Now what we find is, for example in India, you have a very specific targeted budget for inclusion, which is called uh, indigenous budget and also the caste budget for communities. The social barriers most often are not taken into account. They are taken financial uh, kind of a thing, saying that, okay, let's, let's target a little bit of budget. But then how do you overcome the traditional barriers, which are not giving a level playing field for the most excluded communities. And these are intergenerationally excluded. And so this poverty is not just in, happens in one generation, but repeated, repeated forms. And I think where even large countries, I mean, I, I, India is one, as well as some of the programs that we're talking, has not taken sufficient grasp of this and provided specific interventions to overcome these barriers. Okay. And I feel very, very important that when you're talking about financial inclusion, uh, this is very, very critical so that the social barriers can be uh, overcome. Thank, thank you. Uh, uh, there was a third question. Do you want to take a third? And then I'll come back. There's a microphone over there. Okay, uh, hello, uh, Alexander Jaeger from the World Bank. And, and if I'd, I, I dare to add two more Cs, to the, to the list, which is <laughs> climate change. Obviously, the topic is all over the spring meetings. Unfortunately, it's creating more and more stress globally with the warming planet. So how, how do those economic inclusion programs that you are talking about that are very successful, how do they increase the resilience of the most poor, equally the most vulnerable, and how do you see the future of that? Thank you. So let me come back to the panel. So I think the, the, the first two questions were really about, one was more of an infrastructure-related, a hard infrastructure-related regulation issues, 
The second was more on a social uh, infrastructure issue. So maybe, um, Diane, if you want to pick the first one and, and based on the kind of work you've done on Kenya or other countries on how you deal with the regulatory environment would be useful. And maybe, Greg, you can uh, talk about some of the social barriers because obviously you've done a lot of work in India. Um, and yeah. then, you know, obviously you're, you're entitled to take the question on climate as well. So, but over to you. Um, yeah, in terms of the regulatory environment, I, I can't say that we run into huge problems with the regulatory environment. Um, I would say infrastructure is a bigger issue that we deal with. Um, because we are working in these very, very rural communities, um, that are oftentimes cut off from the, the economies and, and we're trying to help them start businesses, we're trying to create local economies. Um, so what we've been doing is actively working with the private sector um, to provide linkages to those um, formal markets and private sector actors. Um, and we've been um, even more deliberative about it in working with um, uh, partners like, uh, there's an organization called Mercy Corps that does market systems development work, um, where they're actually incentivizing private sector actors to come into some of these rural communities um, and, and create a new value chain, a value chain that didn't exist before. And because Village Enterprise in, a, in an area will work with thousands of people and start thousands of enterprises for the first time, there's, a, there's an incentive for that private sector actor to actually um, come into that community. And, um, and then in terms of um, transportation, um, we are seeing um, improvements in terms of infrastructure in Africa, but where I feel there's gonna even be a, a greater leap forward that we're already seeing is through digital technology. Um, so what we're seeing is, you know, that if we empower these people with digital technologies, they're not as dependent on transportation. Um, and they don't have to ever do everything in person. They can use digital technology uh, to make their businesses more profitable. And so I think that's going to play an increasingly important role. And you might have some more reflections on the regulatory environment. I, I don't have a lot of experience with that, but Greg might have some thoughts on that. I mean, I, I would only say the, the, the infrastructure is, is a, and regulation is a very real issue, and we're glad that the World Bank and others are investing in digital public infrastructure, other kinds of roads, transport. Those things still matter a lot, right? Um, so um, just only to say, but, you know, we have to sort of live, did, you know, sort of in the realities where we are, and so sometimes we have to live with the infrastructure that we have today and maybe plan for it to get better over a period of time. But that's one of the, uh, you know, the big things that also the World Bank can do. Um, but I don't know if you want me to take on a couple of the other questions. Sure, please. So I wanted a chance to weave this in anyway, so I'm going to give a sort of a philosophical answer and try and answer both. But it goes back to a fundamental belief that our founder had, um, which is inspired by a Brazilian philosopher, Paulo Freire. Also, though, very much reflected in Amartya Sen's work as uh, development is freedom, which is, what is development? Ultimately, development is about investing in people so that they have the capacities and freedoms to make much greater choices about their own life. And that's ultimately what this kind of work is about. And I go to the social barriers that were raised. Those are very, very real um, in a lot of the contexts we work in, including in Bangladesh. Um, sometimes those are about equip equipping people to start thinking differently about the intergenerational poverty. I mean, one of the, one of the sciences is a, the science of hope. The sense that, and this sounds a little soft, but there's actually some deep science behind it, which is that when you imagine yourself being able to come out of those things, you actually can start to make some of the investments, and our job is to help people make some of those investments. On climate, there's many things we have to do, of course. The work we do is around individual households. And so I think the question of resilience at the household level is their ability to see their circumstances changing and figure out their own solutions to some of those problems. And if you go to Brack's founding, our fundamental belief is not that we are the solvers of their problems, it's that we are, our job 
is to create the conditions where they're better able to solve their own problems on their own because they will always know a million times more about what their circumstances are than, than, than I will uh, sitting here. So how do we make those kinds of investments? I'll just say on the climate resilience, there is some emerging evidence from Bangladesh that those who have been through the program are act actually, actually survive COVID better in, in that kind of a shock. And we might be able to imagine that other kinds of shocks, households that have gotten this kind of investment may be able to navigate those shocks better. I'm happy to share that bit of research. We need a whole lot more research in that area. Um, and, and BRAC is keen in taking a lot of that on. But just to say, um, we fundamentally believe part of the investment should be at the household level, not simply infrastructure or at the community level, that some of resilience is actually people and, and individual households. Sorry, no, long-winded answer. No, no, but it's really, I think, if I were to summarize that, it's really about agency of the poor, yeah. right? Yeah. These programs are really trying to give that agency to decide themselves how to withstand uh, the different shocks. And, and you talked about the experience from Bangladesh, but we also have evidence from West Africa that is showing how some of these programs are able to help uh, poor households withstand climate shocks, right? Yeah. And, 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 and starting to also invest in more, you know, sort of investments that are helping with climate mitigation. So I think here, in many ways, I see these programs having this opportunity, the potential to actually help even the poor have a role in the climate change agenda. So I know it's, it's early days and we'll need more research, but I really see potential. And I think just coming back um, to the title of, of, um, of, this, of this session, it's really about unlocking that potential, right? right. It's really unlocking that potential, uh, but it's about helping the poor create their own jobs, right? Because in many ways, you know, when I, the reason I want to sort of link this to the jobs agenda is because you saw the figures. The figures are daunting. And, and we know some, some of the investments, the macro uh, in, you know, level policies will take a while for, for jobs to be created by the private sector in many of these countries. So to me, the, you know, the, these kind of interventions are really trying to address jobs today, now, yeah. for those who need it most. So I think you know, I want to sort of make sure that, you know, that that context is, is, is very much clear in our heads that this is really about, is, is really helping the poor and, and, and have, giving them agency. Um, any, maybe we do another round, yeah. maybe a few more, maybe one or two, one or two and that's it. So we have two hands here, uh, the gentleman, do you, can I have a microphone there? Um, thank you very much for this session. My name is Samuel Wale. Uh, give directly, see you there. And so I'm listening to this conversation and feeling very much at home because this is what we do. We give or deliver unconditional cash to the poorest households. And that's because we trust in their agency and in their capacity to make their choices. And that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years. And we also work in Bangladesh. We just started there, I think, with Brak. Yeah. Yeah, we're in India. We we're in many of the countries in Africa that we mentioned here. And we're also in the United States, in four states. We're in Georgia, we're in Texas, we're in Michigan, and in Illinois. And the evidence that we have shows that when the poor are given the opportunity to make their own choices, they actually do make very solid investment choices, both in terms of consumption, in terms of investment, and in terms of securing themselves. So I think we are partners in this process, and I look forward to getting to know other people in this journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're, I have one minute left for this session, so I think we'll need to um, We'll need to close, but maybe uh, uh, in, in, in one minute, I just want to sort of thank all of you. And I know we have a live audience which, with whom we've not been able to uh, take questions, but please connect, stay connected with us. You have, uh, can I have the link to the PEI website? Uh, because through that, you can connect not just with us at the World Bank, but also with colleagues here, because as you know, this is, um, 
you know, this is a, is a, a partnership, um, and, and if you go to our website, you will have, um, you will have access to the information uh, that you may want to have, and especially we see many partners who are joining here, but also I want to make a plug for the new report coming up. We will be launching uh, sometime in fall the, the next volume, for, which is the State of Economic Inclusion Report, which will tell you uh, in more detail some of the things we shared, you learned from colleagues here, but even more. Uh, that will be, st so stay tuned and stay connected. Um, follow us on Twitter. Um, and, and, and please uh, do, uh, do uh, help us with, with your own work and research uh, and hope that together we can make this journey uh, forward and, and really get to the number that we want, which is to cover all extreme poor with, uh, with, with ways that they can have agency and really make a difference and unlock that potential. So with that, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Greg, for spending time with us. Thank you. Um, Thanks to PEI. Thank you to the organizers for putting this yeah. together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was really.